I'm Byron Johnson, co-director of the Institute for Studies of Religion, and we're delighted that you're here with us today to hear Bishop Flores, the, the Bishop of Brownsville. The bishop came to our attention because of his writings, particularly in the area of religious liberty, and uh, we reached out to him some time ago to see if he'd be willing to come uh, to campus, pay us a visit. As some of you know, we have a project that we share with Georgetown University on religious freedom, and so we were very interested in his uh, work. He agreed to come, and then the weather got in the way, and um, he was in the midst of an ice storm trying to get to Waco, and we had to reschedule. And uh, so it's our pleasure to have him here with us today. And to do the introductions, we have the president, who's so kind to come and introduce the bishop. Judge Starr. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Johnson and uh, Bishop. We're honored by your visit here. Uh, Father Daniel and others, Father Timothy, who uh, graces us from time to time and programs and other very special guests and my fellow students. Uh, great to see you all. Uh, William O. Douglas was a justice of the Supreme Court of the United States. He served a long time ago. Uh, he was appointed by FDR and served until the 1970s, one of the longest serving members of the Supreme Court of the United States. Uh, he was not known as a person of active faith. He was not known as a churchman, but he wrote this in a Supreme Court decision in 1952. The name of the case for you lawyers and future lawyers is Zurich versus Clausen. The case upheld by a supermajority the practice of many school districts to allow, in public schools to allow school children to leave school early in order to participate voluntarily in religious training at their respective churches or religious communities. When the practice came under constitutional challenge as a violation of the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment, uh, the case wended its way to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court unanimously upheld or sustained the practice against the challenge that it was a violation of our beloved First Amendment. And in uh, upholding this practice, uh, again, emphasizing voluntary leaving of the schools, obviously with parental uh, permission to engage in religious training, not at the, not at the school, but at the uh, church or religious community. Uh, Justice Douglas wrote this, we are a religious people whose institutions presuppose a supreme being. Let me repeat that. We are a religious people whose institutions presuppose a supreme being. So note that he's making two points. First, he's making a cultural point about we, the people, as the preamble says. But he also is making a structural and governmental point. He's talking about our institutions. He wasn't talking about the church. He was about our governmental institutions. He must have had reference to the Declaration of Independence and even the Constitution itself, which does not have a direct reference to God, but nonetheless says in the year of our Lord. So there's a direct Christological reference in the text of the Constitution of the United States uh, itself. Our institutions presuppose a supreme being. Well, the year that he wrote those words was 1952, and times change. Now, none of you was alive in 1952, with very few exceptions. You do not have, oh, thank you for raising your hand. That was the age of students, someone perhaps you've never heard of, Norman Rockwell, paintings, ah, Americana. And his paintings uh, were very romanticized or idealized paintings that adorned the cover of the Saturday Evening Post. Have you ever heard of that? Some of us used to read it. Television was family friendly. I Love Lucy entered its appearance in 1951. Walt Disney was making movies that everybody could watch quite comfortably. Ah, here's a controversial, edgy movie, Cinderella, 1950. Oh, how about Alice in Wonderland? A little scary and not with Johnny Depp. 1951. 
As befits the Saturday evening post in Norman Rockwellian scenes, how about the idea, if you remember, a leisurely Sunday post-church, post-mass dinner with all the family gathered together with no smartphones. The NFL, although it was around, was practically in its infancy. It had no marketplace dominance. There were no Houston Texans. There were no Dallas Cowboys. Uh, I remember tailgating. It simply meant getting too close to the car ahead of you. And that was hard to do in those benighted or halcyon days because the interstate system had yet to come online. I know it's difficult to imagine America without an interstate system. And speaking of online, I was going to mention Stephen Jobs, that's so 20th century. Jeff Bezos, not even a gleam in his father's eye. He was born in 1964. Although it was a quieter time when uh, the justice uh, penned those words, it was emphatically not the golden age. Indeed, in Christian thought, there is no golden age. It's a fallen world. It was, after all, in the United States, still the era of de jure segregation of the races. And geopolitically, the world was deeply and quite dangerously divided. I saw it with my own childhood eyes, nor nervous American families providing underground shelters, not from tornadoes, but from the coming nuclear holocaust. So likewise today, it's no golden age, but we do know this, the culture shifts, the culture changes, and there have indeed been seismic shifts in our culture. And so to help deepen the understanding of our time, we're deeply honored, Bishop, by your visit. He is a great man of the church. The Bishop of Brownsville is blessed with a towering intellect and great learning. He studied philosophy at the University of Dallas, a great place to study, right, Dean Hibbs? And received his MDiv at Holy Trinity Seminary, uh, and then completed his doctoral work at the Angelicum in Rome. And so this afternoon, we're not going to go back to the days of William O. Douglas and Zorach B. Clausen. We're going to reflect together on our contemporary culture and in particularly the unfolding national conversation with respect to religious liberty in America, a conversation that we are enjoying here at Baylor University. And so would you please join me in extending a very warm Baylor welcome to our distinguished guest, Bishop Daniel Flores. move. There you go. Well, Judge Starr, thank you very much. Dr. Johnson, for your kind hospitality and the invitation to the Institute. And I consider it one of the great honors of my time as a bishop, as a priest of the Catholic Church to speak here. Universities, in their best moments, are places where uh, a common conversation happens that has to do with the search for the truth. It's always been part of the university tradition that especially goes back to the early Middle Ages, that it was understood as a common endeavor, whereby we are held together by a common confidence that the truth is something not only that is worth looking for, but it's something that can be found, if only haltingly at certain times. And yet progress can be made. So I consider this a moment when that university as a community in, in love with the truth can have its conversation. It's an ongoing one that crosses generations and crosses time. And particularly here at Baylor, because it's an opportunity for us to, to kind of reflect together on what holds so many different Christian denominations in particular uh, together in our sense of, of the place of faith in our lives, both as individuals and as members of respective communities. If you haven't been to Brownsville, you're more than welcome anytime you want. As I tell people, I am the happiest bishop in the United States because Brownsville is a great place to be. 
Bienvenidos al Valle si quieren llegar un día. ¿no? My remarks uh, are things I've thought about, thought about for a while. Uh, I gave a lecture a few years ago at the University of St. Thomas in Houston. Um, you get invited to give lectures there, but it helps if you taught there at one time. Um, and, and it was my first occasion to kind of put some things together. Um, this is kind of a development of that talk and some pulling together some things that have happened since then. And it's, it's part of the ongoing conversation in my own head as I talk to other people. As I say, it's kind of a journey that we go through when it comes to purifying our thought and making it sharper. I'm kind of calling this talk, Render Unto Caesar. I don't know, it just struck me. It would be fair to say that the Christian Church in general, and the Catholic Church in particular, has historically had an uneasy and sometimes contentious relationship to Caesar. The Caesar about whose tax Jesus was asked in Matthew chapter 22 was an ever-present reality in Jerusalem and Galilee, a reality that Jesus faced. And the Lord's response to the question about whether it was lawful to pay the tax or not gives us a window into this pervasive reality. The early Christians understood the teaching about the relationship between Caesar and the church as a kind of modus vivendi. As long as the world shall last, Caesar you will always have with you. Yet the kingdom of God is in our midst, and its dynamic in human affairs for the Christians was their first concern. Paul, of course, you know, frequently asked for prayers on behalf of the emperor. Yet, he insisted that we are citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. And he insisted that Christian loyalty was owed first to the gospel before any human power. So the early Christians sort of had an connatural sense that Caesar had certain prerogatives implicit in his responsibility to maintain the peace and the roads but that there, was li there were limits, and there are limits, to what Caesar can demand. The Romans of ancient times tended toward the deification of their emperors and their heroes. As such, popular sentiment aided their efforts to cement public order. This uh, popular dynamic of divinizing our heroes uh, persists even in secular cultures, I would think. For the Romans, though, as, a simple, as simple a gesture as placing incense in front of the statue of Caesar was a political religious act confirming this public order. The Christians in the times of Peter and Paul, like everyone else, were obliged to pay the public incense as a sign of their loyalty to Caesar, his gods, and his empire. For the Christians, such an act was an unacceptable coercion to profess the credo of the world, namely that credo which says that here is our only city, and Caesar runs it, so make the best of it. Christians did not believe this, so they could not do it. June 30th is the day on the Catholic Church's calendar where we remember the first martyrs of the Church of Rome, and this testifies to how the early modus vivendi between church and state played itself out. They were over the last several years, the Church, the United States, and governmental authority on a federal and state level have had a series of contentious disagreements. Most notably, litigation continues over the Health and Human Services Rule for implementation of the universal health care coverage, and, continue, and concerns continue about immigration laws limiting charitable activity of the churches in particular states. These are two particularly present issues. Most recently, perhaps you are aware, and more locally, the city of Houston demanded copies of sermons and speeches of certain evangelical pastors. One could say that all of these were unrelated, are unrelated issues, and after all, they'll be resolved the way we always resolve things in the courts. Or, and I think this is more realistic, we can view the controversies as related on a deeper level, and indicative of a significant cultural and social shift affecting the context within which the churches operate in the United States. The three issues I mentioned and others I could mention all have this in common. Up to what point does Caesar have the right, in the name of public order, to demand that the churches act or speak in a certain way? 
What I say this afternoon obviously flows from a Catholic context. That's the one I know best. However, what I suggest about the deeper issues is analogously relevant to other religious bodies present in the United States. Religious freedom issues affect us all, and I would like to look at the first two issues that I mentioned, the HHS rule and the immigration laws, in order to describe points of contention between the churches and state in particular. And then I will move to a discussion of the underlying issues and the social political headwinds that are facing believers in our society. Part one. By the way, this is divided in three parts, like Gaul and the Summa, okay? <laughs> Current controversies, part one, pars prima. I fear that I have to go into some detail about some of the issues recently impacting religious freedom controversies. The United States Congress passed and the President signed the Affordable Care Act of 2010. At that time, the Catholic Church in the United States, speaking through its bishops, encouraged the notion of a reform of the health care system in the United States in order to make coverage universal and acceptable and accessible. However, at the time of the bill's vote in Congress, the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops opposed passage of this bill on three principal grounds. First, it did not explicitly contain language prohibiting the use of federal funds to pay for abortion, language that was available in previous legislative initiatives such as the Hyde Amendment. Second, the bill as proposed did not have language explicit enough on what is widely known as the Conscience Protection Clause. The language in the view of the bishops was inadequate to protect Catholic and other religious institutions seeking a religious, a religious exemption for aspects of coverage that conflict, that conflict with the teachings of a religious body. The bishops, in fact, had in mind the likelihood that contraceptive and abortifacient drugs would be part of the proposed health care coverage mandated by the government. We wanted religious exemptions to protect our service institutions from those requirements. Thirdly, and not so often referred to in the uh, common narrative of this particular event in our history, the bishops opposed the bill because it explicitly excluded undocumented immigrants from access to health care service under the new law. In Catholic social teaching, access to health care is a human good rooted in nature and prior to distinctions of legal status found in civil law. Now, the church's position on the bill was a principled one based on Catholic and reasonable understanding, at least from our point of view, of what constitutes the common good. I'll say more about the common good later. For now, it is sufficient to note that the flaws in the bill were, sufficient, were judged to be sufficiently grave so as to vitiate the good the law sought to accomplish. As you will recall, the bill passed narrowly in a contentious vote. I worry, by the way, that our memory is fairly short, even in recent events. That's why I kind of for my own purpose, we tend to forget how it is that we got here even recently. That's part of the 24-hour news cycle. If it happened three days ago, we tend to think, how long ago was that? This was only 2010. In any case, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services sometime later began formulating the particular policy norms that would be used to enforce the requirements of the Affordable Care Act, what has become known as the HHS mandate requires that all health insurance plans cover women's preventive services such as sterilization and contraceptives, including some abortifacients. Within this universal mandate was a narrowly crafted exemption for a religious employer. A religious employer, employer is defined as an institution whose main purpose is the inculcation of religious values, whose primar who primarily employs persons who adhere to its religious tenets, and which primarily serves persons who share its religious faith and is a nonprofit organization described in various sections of the IRS code. The effect of this legal mandate is to exclude from the religious exemption those religious institutions whose ex activities do not have the aim of primarily inculcating religious values and which do not necessarily hire persons from within the religious body and which serve persons who are not primarily adher adherents to that particular faith. Take, for example, a Catholic or Methodist or Baptist hospital or university, which de facto falls outside the narrow definition. It serves people outside the denomination, 
Those who are employed are not necessarily members of the denomination, yet it's sponsored by a particular religious body. They would fall outside the exemption. The same could be said for many Catholic charities organizations, wherein, for example, we organize ourselves to feed the poor and to, and to assist with housing and other sorts of social needs because we consider that part of our mission. These institutions would be required to offer the coverage which the sponsoring religious body might find morally objectionable. The attempt at an accommodation to objections raised by the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops was no accommodation at all, since it merely shifted the obligation to pay for these morally objectionable services to the insurance provider. There are two problems with this. The cost to the provider is inevitably passed on to the consumer. In this case, the consumer is a religious institution, leaving such institutions in the position of subsidizing what it considers morally objectionable practice. Secondly, the so-called accommodation ignores the fact that many dioceses and other ecclesiastical institutions are self-insured. We are the provider. Further, the introduction of a referral system by which the religious institution certifies to a third party that it cannot provide the objectionable coverage, thereby causing the third party to provide it, is not really helpful to a religious conscience because the certification itself implicates us in a kind of what we call material cooperation that would be morally unacceptable if it were not coerced. In other words, we would never think of such a thing unless we were forced to, and even then, we would be placed in a Scylla and Charybdis dilemma of having to choose between not providing health care to our employees, which, by the way, we consider providing health care to employees to be a very important social good. But having to choose between that and the other side of facilitating procedures which the religious body considers morally repugnant. The whole controversy is now in the court system since neither the administration nor the Congress has been willing to remedy the flaws in the law. Even apart from the issue about what options a bishop, for example, has available to him if forced to cooperate materially, because we do have options, what can we do? Well, we can close the institution, close Catholic charities, close our hospitals, or we can make a referral under protest, we could do that. Or we could legally separate, you can do that, legally separate your service institutions from the body of the church, we could do that. But really, I think what the, the, fi the prior question is, we should be asking ourselves is, how is it that we have gotten to this point in the first place, that we would have to contemplate such options? No one is forced to go to our hospitals or to our universities. They are free to do so. The second case, the kind of case I would like to discuss has to do with interference with the mission of the church on a state and local level. Because of the inability of the federal government to reach a political consensus concerning the reformation of immigration law, state and local, local governments have made various attempts to pass particular legislation rendering illegal many services and activities which citizens and institutions may provide to undocumented immigrants. Of particular note are two cases from earlier this decade, one involving the state of Alabama and the other involving the state of Arizona. Act number 2011-535, if you want to look it up, there it is, known as the Beeson Hammond Alabama Taxpayer and Citizen Protection Act, was signed into law in June 2011. It contained a number of provisions making it a crime to receive local public assistance without proof of proper residency status. Archbishop Brody of Mobile, Alabama, issued the following statement about the law at the time of its passage. The new Alabama law makes it illegal for a Catholic priest to baptize, hear the confession, or celebrate the anointing of the sick with or preach the word of God to an undocumented immigrant. Nor can we encourage them to attend Mass or give them a ride to Mass. It would be illegal, it is illegal, to allow them to attend adult scripture courses or attend CCD or Sunday school classes. It is illegal for the clergy to counsel them in times of difficulty or in preparation for marriage. It is illegal for them to come to our Alcoholic Anonymous meetings or other recovery groups at our churches. The law prohibits every activity of our St. Vincent de Paul chapters and Catholic social services. If it involves an undocumented immigrant, it is illegal to give the disabled person a ride to the doctor, give food or clothing or financial assistance in an emergency, allow them to shop at our thrift stores or learn English. It is illegal to counsel a mother who has a problem in pregnancy or to help her with her baby food or diapers, thus making it far more likely that she will choose abortion. 
because the law passed. Mention could also be made of the more widely known Arizona law, which had similar provisions. Objections raised by the bishops of Arizona and the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops reflect the same concerns expressed by the bishops more recently in the Alabama situation. I would like to reference for you an amicus brief filed by the Conference of Catholic Bishops before the Supreme Court when the Arizona law was up for review. The church is acutely interested in protecting religious liberty of Catholic and other religious institutions. The church's religious faith, like that of many religious denominations, including those who join this brief, requires it to offer charity. See, our argument is the faith requires us to offer charity. Ranging from soup kitchens to homeless shelters to all in need, whether they are present in this country legally or not. Yet the bill and related state immigration laws have provisions that could either criminalize this charity, criminalize those who provide it, or even permit it, or require the institutions that provide it to engage in costly, if not impossible, monitoring of the individuals they serve, and then to exclude from that charity all those whose presence Arizona and other states would then criminalize. This in itself, as well as the proliferation of 50 different laws of this kind, would un unnecessarily intrude on the church's religious liberty. In both the Alabama case and the Arizona case, the courts ruled against the restrictions I have just mentioned. However, the rulings were based largely on the fact that immigration law is a matter of federal jurisdiction. The states may not usurp the matter into their jurisdictions. However, two problems remain. First, we can expect that aspects of the laws in question will be copied in other states in an effort to find a formulation some future Supreme Court will find tolerable. The influx of Central American unaccompanied minors into the United States this last summer placed the issue of immigration law back in the political vortex as states all over the country objected to the way the federal government managed or failed to manage the situation. But there's a second problem and perhaps more ominous. We should note that the Supreme Court setting aside of much of what was contained in the state immigration bills rested on the notion that jurisdiction clearly lies with the federal government on immigration matters. Religious freedom was not really tested in these cases. What will we do if some future Congress, that is the federal level, passes and a president signs a federal immigration law placing precisely these kinds of restrictions on church, church social and charitable activities? Given the swings in public sentiment on this issue particularly, this is not so hard to imagine. The mayhem would be enormous, more contentious litigation would follow, it would eventually make its way to the Supreme Court, and an outcome favorable to religious freedom cannot in any way be taken for granted. What would a religious charitable organization do in such an eventuality? To what extent can Caesar limit the charitable activity of the church? I think we need to be thinking about this. Second part and the first part. Why this matters to a Christian. Put simply, Catholics and many other Christians hold that it is contrary to the natural law and the common good to withhold basic human care, be it food, water, or medical, or spiritual care from someone simply because of documentary status. All of these goods are due to persons because they are persons and are prior to civil distinctions. The obligation to care for the hungry and the thirsty issues from human dignity, which flows from God. It does not flow from the state. Our quarrel with the state lies on this point. The state now has a history of claiming that the civil conferral of recognition through such things as residency or citizenship papers are the basis for judging whether a hungry person should be fed. This is contrary to reason and to justice in a human society. Further, and more importantly for us, it is contrary to the divine mandate confided to the church. The Lord did not say, feed the hungry, provided their papers are in order. Concerning the health care law, 
Healthcare is a good due, again, to the human person, who by virtue of the inscriptions of the natural law is a bearer of inviolable dignity. It is a violation of that dignity to withhold or render inaccessible the basic care needed to prevent disease, heal, and sustain human life. This is true regardless of documentary status. However, and this is part of the church's public argument in the social order, from the point of view, at least of the Catholic Church, I cannot speak for others, healthcare, understood as a social good, does not include abortion or measures designed to prevent contraception, promote sterilization, and prevent birth. Simply put, the church does not consider the conception and birth of a child to be a disease, the prevention of which requires a society's resources, much less the government's active promotion. Now, taking all these issues together, I propose that we should examine two vital concerns that emerge from all of them. The first is the issue of religious freedom itself as a reality in American legal and political discourse and as a Christian doctrine. The second issue is the common good, which I shall, I'll treat the first first and the second later. First, religious freedom. You see, you have to deal with the particular before you get to the universal. Okay. First part, well, actually the second part, religious freedom and the American experience. I'm sure you will all find this kind of a quick review of what you are very familiar with. The American attempt at codifying religious freedom reflected in part an enlightenment rejection of an established or favored religion within the state, and in part, an effort to limit Caesar from controlling too much, and in part, it reflected a favorable evaluation of the good of religion in general. These rational impulses proceeded to organize a state around the principle that prior historical claims that the supremacy of one religion over another, and thus its privileged status within the state, ran counter to founding notions of freedom in a religiously pluralist community. The United States Constitution itself attempts to arrive at a socio-political consensus on how to manage religi religious loyalties, which everybody knew were capable of making weighty claims on human persons. Those claims had spurred quite a bit of movement from, Eng from England to the colonies in the first place. The founding of the Republic also certainly involved a strong desire to keep Caesar from controlling everything. The founding thinkers shared a strong suspicion that if given half a chance, Caesar could not help himself from tyrannical pretension. Checks and balances, and freedom of religion, and of the press, and of association were all inscribed to the Constitution precisely to set markers for Caesar. There was a sense in the impulse towards limited government that for it to work, peoples and intermediate institutions had to have a legally protected space within which to operate, cooperate, compete, and contribute to the greater good of the society. Thus churches, philanthropic, Organizations, tea societies, guilds, and so many other diverse institutions were thought to have great goods to contribute to society, provided they were not excessively interfered with by a governmental authority. The American effort, though, rested on a prior sensibility and judgment that religion in general offers a great good to society, and that impeding its good is neither the right of the state nor in the interest of the people. Further, for religious freedom to operate in the societal sphere encouraged the healthy development of other types of non-governmental human associations. In short, the founders sort of thought it was good to have other sorts of associations and bodies operating that weren't coming from the top. It is this prior contextual sensibility about the positive good that religious vigor represents that is rather anemic in our time. And since cultural presuppositions are living things, and provide context to law and its interpretation by a living body, this erosion is particularly problematic for us. Governments could not so easily dismiss claims of religious freedom with the good of religion in general for a society held in higher esteem within the cultural framework that produces the law. How much of the current eroded status is our responsibility as believers and as religious bodies is worth reflecting upon. Nature and government both abhor a vacuum, and Caesar sometimes has a lidless eye. 
It's worth noting that Western Europe European and Latin American attempts in the 19th and early 20th century were less imbued with a sense of the benefits society at large receives from religious institutions. From the French Revolution to the anti-clerical dynamics of, the, of revolutionary Mexico to the Spanish Civil War, we can rightly see a different historical trajectory, one that thought that the severe reduction of religious influence better served the demands of the common good. The anti-clerical impulses in these countries were particularly concerned to limit the role of the church in the education of children. You go back and read the histories of the persecution of the church in Mexico and in Spain, and that's the first thing, education that was severed from the hands of the church. Why? Well, it was seeking, it was a common understood reality that the church's role in education was the principal obstacle to establishing a social framework based on positive rational principles. As a rule, if you look at your history, in Latin America especially, and in uh, Western Europe, as a rule, secularization in traditionally Catholic countries has been a bloodier process in the United States. Not surprising then that the Catholic teaching in the modern age is much warmer to an American paradigm of religious freedom in secular society than some of the paradigms found in Western Europe and Latin America. In fact, Pope, both Pope John Paul II and Pope Benedict XVI spoke with high praise for the American ideal of religious freedom as expressed in the US Constitution and through the better moments of our history recognizing quite rightly that it was religious bodies themselves who often promoted the most beneficial social reform, such as the abolition of slavery and the passage of civil rights laws. Now a word about religious freedom as a matter of Catholic doctrine, anyway. There was a document entitled Dignitatis Humanae, which is one of the last documents promulgated by the Second Vatican Council in 1965, and it deals with the issue of religious freedom. It is a mature expression of Catholic doctrine that springs from a long tradition of Catholic theological anthropology. I think it is worthwhile for all Christians to look closely at Dignitatis Humanae, even if they do not recognize the binding authority of an ecumenical council presided over by the Pope of Rome. It was, in a sense, a document centuries in the forming and its inner gospel logic can be helpful, I think, for all of us in this contentious age. This is looking at religious freedom from the point of view of scripture and not from constitutional law. The main focus of intelligibility in the document is the focus upon the dignity of the moral subject. And I quote, it is in accordance with their dignity as persons, that is beings endowed with reason and free will and therefore privileged to bear personal responsibility that all people should be at once impelled by nature and also bound by moral obligation to seek the truth, especially religious truth. They are also bound to adhere to the truth once it is known and to order their whole lives in accord with the demands of the truth. Now this teaching is rooted in things like the all-important prologue to the second part of the Summa where St. Thomas locates the divine image in man precisely in the threefold attribute of intellect, freedom, and will, and self-governance. We have within ourselves, St. Thomas said, the power and principle of our own operation, and therefore we move ourselves to the truth. Now, Dignitatis Humanae, speaking of civil governments in particular, states in number three that, quote, it would clearly transgress the limits set to its power were the state to presume to command or forbid acts that are religious. But it is particularly to be noted that acts that are religious includes more than acts of cultic worship, Dignitatis Humanae specifically teaches the duty of society to protect the space within a free society for the church's members to organize and serve in the public sphere. And so I quote again, in addition it comes from the meaning of religious freedom that religious communities should not be prohibited from freely undertaking to show the special value of their doctrine in what concerns the organization of society and the inspiration of the whole of human activity. The social nature of man and the very nature of religion afford the foundation of the right of men freely to hold meetings and to establish educational, cultural, charitable, and social organizations under the impulse of their own religious sense. 
The teaching of Dignitatis Humanae has been defended and developed since the Council, and with particular urgency more recently as the rise of what I would call aggressive secularity opened up a new line of contention. What we are seeing today is a controverting of Dignitatis Humanae's claim that the social nature of man and the nature of religion has something to do with religious freedom. Traditionally, we have conceived, for example, of people in a society and the church as members of a body. A Christian belongs to two bodies, de facto, with the body of Christ taking precedence. But he also belongs to the civil body. But even from a purely sociological perspective, religions have been thought of as corporate entities, as bodies. Aggressive secularity in the public order pushes religious adherence into the private sphere. We no longer speak so much about bodies of churches, bodies of believers, but rather increasingly our own people see religious adherence as a purely private matter. I'm a believer, but I don't belong to any body. This development merits particular attention since it informs the current cultural context for understanding the erosion of religious freedom in American life today. In a privatized society, freedom of religion becomes identified with freedom to worship as one pleases, not with the presence of a body within the society. One could argue that the privatization of religion is a manifestation of a long cultural move toward insulated human living, at least in the economically advanced West. I remember reading a book by Bart Giamatti once, the former commissioner of baseball, called Take Time for Paradise. And he lamented the fact that people spent so much time now jogging, listening to music, it's a privatized entertainment, as opposed to going to watch baseball. He thought this was a sign of something happening to the culture, the privatization of everything. MySpace. It's a great book, you want to read it, Bart Giamatti. He was a great commissioner. In any case, I would like to point out a couple of references. In 1995, Pope John Paul II lamented how democratic societies of the West urged persons to keep their religious convictions private and out of the public realm. John Paul II said, does this not mean that society not only excludes the contribution of religion to its institutional life, but also promotes a culture which redefines man as less than what he is? In other words, the issue is, don't believers also belong to the body of the civil society and therefore ought to participate in a public way as believers? That's the question. The key point here is a Christian conviction that people in general, and Christians in particular, act in a concerted way with and through the bodies to which they belong. Hence, Dignitati Humanae's use of the phrase, the social nature of man and the very nature of religion. Pope Benedict frequently proposed an alternative view of secularity, though, one that does not relegate religious conviction to the extreme periphery of social life. You might want to look at his message for the World Day of Peace in January of 2011, where he says, society as an expression of the person and of all his or her constitutive dimensions must live and organize itself in a way that favors openness to transcendence. Precisely for this reason, the laws and institutions of a society cannot be shaped in such a way as to ignore the religious dimension of its citizens or to prescind completely from it. Through the democratic activity of citizens conscious of their lofty calling, lofty calling, those laws and institutions must adequately reflect the authentic nature of the person and support its religious dimension. Note the claim here. Human, pe human persons have a religious dimension by simply being human, and therefore the state needs to respect that openness to the transcendent. Benedict has such a mind. And so he goes on to say, since the latter is not a creation of the state, since the latter is not a creation of the state, it cannot be manipulated by the state, but must rather be acknowledged and respected by it. Clearly, over the last decades since the Dignitatis Humanae, the Church has had a sense of an urgency to view the issue of religious freedom from the perspective of the state's pretension to push religion viewed as an organized body from the public sphere. This is the current sort of battle line. The Church religion has no place in public life because it is a purely private matter. 
What I'm proposing is that this is a fairly novel claim. I use the analogy of the battle line somewhat advisedly. Perhaps the military analogy is problematic. But Pope Francis speaks of the church as a field hospital for the walking wounded, one of his favorite ways of describing it. The field hospital's existence as a free institution is what is in question today. Religion viewed as a field hospital is a good, is a human good that is not from the state and therefore must be respected by the state. Finally, part three, my conclusion, the church, the common good. It is worth noting about how these controversies between the bishops and the civil authority have played out, in recent, played out recently. One thing to note about it is the diversity of reactions to Christian teaching, at least from the Catholic Church's perspective, what we say about these things. To be blunt, I'll put it this way, liberal pundits and educators tend to think that we Catholics are onto something important about human dignity when we talk about our principal position on the care for immigrants. Yes, they're probably onto something there. The more conservative pundits and educators do not. On the other hand, we hear support from conservative politicians on the HHS mandate, while the liberal persuaders argue we need to give up the lost argument on artificial contraception and so forth. It's not such a big deal, they tell us, and when we mention that what passes for contraception the government's mind is in fact often or more efficient, well, we are told we're just talking about a few cells anyway. My point is that these very political and media reactions to our position should hardly surprise us. I simply point out that we, we, that is, I can speak for myself, the church I represent, we speak about the common good in a culture where our interlocutors in public policy are engaged in a race to create a consensus about the popular good. The popular good and the common good are two different notions. Democratic and Republican governments since Plato and Aristotle have been recognized as forms of public order that work well when they work well, but very badly when they work badly. The popular good is sometimes, I would describe it as the will moving unconsidered reason to judgment. The will moving unconsidered reason to judgment. While the common good is reason moving the will to well-considered judgment. Perceptions of the popular good can change radically and fairly quickly, it just takes a good campaign. The common good does not change radically. It's rooted in human nature and it's rooted in being made in the image and likeness of God. What the common good needs is a lamppost upon which to stand. It has its own innate power to persuade. The good and the true do have a way of speaking for themselves. It is our responsibility, however, to witness to these so, they can, so that they can speak for themselves. But if the societal space within which religious bodies can offer a lampstand or a field hospital is reduced, then people in general never get a chance to decide if they think they might benefit from the light or from the field hospital. From the perspective of the Christian doctrine of religious freedom, it is a necessary good for human society that religious bodies have space to operate freely. Such a way of organizing society respects this aspect of the common good. The space religious bodies have to operate freely in this society is no longer understood, however, as a common good for society, giving them perspectives on the deeper purposes of life that the state could not. If this part were understood as a good, that is, the religious dimension as an organized body, president society, it would not be so easily controverted. To a large degree, popular good has replaced the common good as the focus of political discourse, because to discuss the common good, you have to think that reason can adjudicate reality fairly on most of the big issues. With the decline of confidence in reason has come a collapse of political discourse into the single criteria of the popular will. Hence, all the efforts made at shaping at least the perception of what the popular will actually is. I am not overly optimistic that in this environment a reasoned discourse can be had about what public policy is or is not in keeping with the common good. Tolkien said in one of his letters, I am a Roman Catholic. I can only conceive of history as one long series of failures. 
He was a good Augustinian. But that's because grace triumphs, you see. <clears throat> Continuing controversies about the legal definition of marriage in society dominates the headlines. Things are rapidly moving on all these issues. The Houston controversy I mentioned at the beginning involving the subpoena of pastor's sermons points to how quickly traditional safeguards of religious liberty and speech rights can be forgotten in the race for a new civil hegemony. By the way, the Roman Catholic Archdiocese of Galveston, Houston, which is not a party to the litigation, issued the following statement when the subpoena was issued. And I quote, the subpoena was seeking, among other things, copies of sermons and speeches. Churches in the United States have always had the right to preach the gospel without fear of political or legal interference. We understand that the city plans to narrow the scope of the subpoena to remove sermons, but we, the Archdiocese of Galveston, Houston, remain troubled. The revised subpoena will still seek the production of the pastor's emails and other forms of communication. These subpoenas could be the first step toward government regulation of speech and restriction of the free exercise of religion. This is unacceptable. What we teach about the common goods of society and the good of the family and society may prevail against the tide that moves to redefine everything. It may not. The promise made that the church would not fail in her faith was not glossed by the Lord Jesus to mean that whole societies would never lose their reason. People tell me, all the time actually, that Christians in general, and we bishops in particular, are terrible at dealing with the media and political culture. Probably so. They're probably right. Though maybe I think it would be worse if we were actually good at it. For good reason, Gandalf did not want the ring. I think we have to find the appropriate language to speak about the common good and right reason for the good of the whole society. Knowing, however, that we may never win the day in the media, but we owe it to reason and thus to our brothers and sisters in human society to try our best. Chesterton once said, if it's worth doing, it's worth doing badly. Think about it. Justice may prevail despite our failures. In fact, it will. Why? Because a larger providence governs the world, one that no one can manipulate. In the meantime, I think we must hold firm on a common evangelical witness to the truth that we believe is revealed in the gospel. The truth about what is good for us and for the human race. The witness is largely found in how our socially organized public services define themselves. We may have to pay a price to protect this witness, but perhaps the Lord God purifies his church in this way, making her less self-interested and more authentically a body seeking in charity the good of others. May it be so. Thank you very much. Oh, sure, I'll be happy to. I'm, I'm happy to take a question or two or three or however you want. If I can't answer it, I'll tell you. I don't know. Oh, mm -hmm. uh, you spoke uh, for a moment about popular good and common good and the distinction between them both. How do you think that popular good came to replace the common good? Do you think this is a facet of democratic societies or what led to this replacement? I think there's a couple of factors. I don't think necessarily it's tied to democratic societies. I mean, there was no culture in the history of the world that had a higher regard for right reason than the ancient Greeks, and that's kind of where the democratic movement first got its, its first historical major paradigm. I think it has to do with the late 14th century. It's a philosophical, theological problem with regard to voluntarism and the reduction of the sphere within which reason made judgments about the truth of creation, nature, and God himself. It was a theological dispute. You go back and read Occam and compare him to Scotus, and then compare Scotus to Thomas Aquinas, and you get a, a, a progressive reduction. 
such that finally in Akam what you get is that a thing is good because God said so. And God could have made a world wherein the way to salvation was murder because it's purely his will. That's Akam in a simplified. So I think once you reduce reason to having very little to be able to say about the true and the good, and that it ultimately is a voluntary, it's a matter of the will. What the authority, ha what, the, what the lawgiver decides is good, is good. That then makes it more difficult. And this is a long, I mean, it's a long cultural mood from, from the University of Oxford, where, you know, Occam and, and, and Scotus were into, into, but by the 18th century, I think what you have then is kind of a, a, a reduction of the, of the space uh, we're in, we're, in, we're in the possibility of, of coming to a consensus about the good as a reasoned judgment. Sorry to break down. Um, um, Jacques Legoff, who wrote that very fine book, um, um, what was it called? The Medieval Imagination. He talks about the fact that for most of the world, at least the Western world, the Middle Ages didn't end till the end of the 19th century. Because that's when suddenly the Industrial Revolution changes, how people live in their towns, and their, most of it was rural, and that that's when the cultural shift happens, and everything begins to be basically a matter of the role of the government is to keep the peace and make no judgments. And I think once that happens, it's a long progressive, it's a long progressive move in history. Then, then you basically get, well, okay, then what are we left with? Well, if it's about the will, and if the fine, in, in modern secular society, it's no longer about the will of God, because who's to say? It's rather about the, well, then who's the lawgiver? Well, the people are. Well, then what's the will of the people? That's the good. The will of God, over several centuries, as the arbiter of the good, becomes, becomes translated into the will of the people as the arbitration for the good, and then what happens is, well, then, whatever the popular will decides, that is good. I'm convinced that if Pilate were standing today and he had the Messiah in front of him, he would not ask him, truth, what is that? He would ask him, good, what is that? It's what the people say it is. As a result, I think that's one of the reasons why, you see, I, think, I, I do think it's beho it behooves Christian denominations to push back and defend, I'm not talking politically, defend the prerogatives of reason to say something about justice, about goodness, and about the truth as within the capacity. I think that was the great project of, of, of Ratzinger as the cardinal, but also as Pope Benedict, when he be to, is to kind of reestablish the capacity of a dialogue about what reason can do, because it makes a difference in society, that we can actually come to consensus of what the reasonable good is. It wasn't so hard 150 years ago, and even 50 years ago. Much of what we've seen change radically in terms of the redefining of what society's goods are has happened within our lifetime. It may take a while to get from Occam to hear, but we're here. Mm. Yep. Trevor, from St. Joseph's in Belmont. You mentioned pushback. Mm -hmm. And uh, Martin Luther King, I think, had a great idea in pushback with his nonviolent demonstrations and the boycotts and the civil rights. Mm -hmm. Do you think the Catholic Church can do something like that? Yes, I think there's something like that. I, I think it was going to take staying away from stores on Sunday. I think I think it, that's a good that's a good thing. I think we could preach about that. But uh, mm, I'll tell you what's more likely to happen. If the day comes when the federal government passes a law that says that the church is limited in her charitable outreach to the undocumented, I think at that point, um, because it, I think at that point the bishops would probably very much say, well, then put us in jail. At least, I think, a number of bishops I've talked about. Now, we haven't gotten to that point. But, but then put us in jail. I mean, if you can tell us we can't feed the hungry and clothe the naked until you tell us that they have the appropriate paperwork, that's beyond Caesar has way overreached. Ministry and say, well, we're not going to follow it. We're not going to give you 
or even in this Houston case, we're not going to give you. Right. Yes. I, I, I think I think that there would be that, that but I think what happens there though is that individual individual local communities have to make and even individuals personally affected have to make the decision as to where they draw the line and say, I cannot in conscience do this. And so and I realize I have to accept the consequences. But that's the whole point of what a Christian witness is. You finally decide, you know, the hour has come. You know, I've always been struck by the way the Gospel of John speaks about Jesus' hour. He knows the hour is not yet, and so he walks through the crowd. It's not yet. I think every Christian, at a certain point, when faced by a by a, a choice between even either acquiescing to what it, to a demand it considers that's, that 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 that, that, a, that Caesar proposes that is contrary to Christian belief and Christian practice, at what point do we say the hour is here? And sometimes it's an individual. I mean, you look at the history of the early church. It wasn't like no pope decided, okay, we're all going to stand firm here and we're all going to be martyrs. No. It was the local churches who kind of faced the, the problem and, and, and they said, we can't do this. That's why we can't put the incense in front of Caesar's statue. We can't do it. That was here. That was there because they didn't have the mass communication anyway. And, 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 the, and the papacy never had that much power in the first place. So in terms of telling people where they were going to stand. But I think, I think you have to trust the Holy Spirit in that that it does call people to make a witness at certain points, and, and sometimes it comes out in the most surprising ways. Um, now, I think we have to be kind of put this in context, though, because I just gave you a fairly lengthy, fairly dull conversation about, about, about religious freedom in the United States, because it's important that we be aware of what's happening in our country, so that we can at least, at least, at least know what the issues are and try to at least, you know, because we still have the power to vote about these things and we can talk to our legislators and we can raise the consciousness. But you know as well as I do that, that right this very minute there are parts in the world where people are dying because of what they believe. And this is happening because there is, there is, there is a, a, a it has been, <laughs> this is not new. I mean, it happened during the communist regimes, it happened during the Nazi regimes, it happens in every totalitarian regime, you have to silence the church whatever church, the church is. And it's happening in a lot of different ways. And you know it as well as I do. I think one of the things that we have to do if we're gonna talk about religious freedom is not only talk about our own context, because one of the reasons our context is important is because we need to kind of show the world that it is possible to live in a, in a religiously pluralistic society in a way that respects the place of diversity of religions in the place. Because the world needs to kind of recapture that that's a reasonable thing. Because frankly, the, a lot of parts of the world, like I said, you know, there was no guarantee in the gospel that the world would not lose its reason, has lost its reason when it comes to how it deals with religion. And it fits into a secular narrative that says all religion is crazy anyway, and so why would you, and so, and so they're all extremists. Because religion is irrational, that's the narrative. You see, we have to say, no, it's not irrational. In fact, it's more rational if you, Realize. So my point is, though, that, that we have to realize that there are, that those kind of decisions about giving the witness, which stretches from the time of the first martyrs of the Church of Rome in North Africa, the, the martyrs of, you know, through the history of all the churches, um, is, is a witness that the Holy Spirit inspires in Christians who say, I cannot, this is a matter that involves my denying the Lord, and I cannot do that. And do with me what you must. You know, you've got to read the letters of St. Ignatius of Antioch and then compare them to the final letters of St. Thomas More, who was not at all anxious to be martyred, but knew at a certain point, you know, you know he, he tried to find every possible way to avoid it. I don't think we need to go looking for it. We want, to, we want to find an accommodation that respects Caesar has his place, but God first, that's the thing, so yeah. That's how I talk about that. Yeah, mm-hmm. Right. 
Right. Well, I think that's a very good question because it, it does get, you know, it does get very practical. And as I, as I often say to my folks back home, you know, if the gospel is not practical, what's the point? You know, if it doesn't actually affect how it is. And I think, I think there, I think there's some things that Pope Benedict talked about, but I think there's certain things that Pope Francis does that is kind of, kind of, kind of, kind of emphasizing what this is about. That everything has to start in reading, you know, whatsoever you do the least of mine you do to me, reading that gospel as, as, as basically the fundamental paradigm by which you treat with respect the person who disagrees with you, even if it is a, a disagreement about fundamental principles. That there is, no, there is no issue upon which one can base the, the assumption that this allows me the permission to disrespect the inviolable dignity of that person. I think that, if we can, if we can, if we could kind of agree on that, I think that would open up a whole, a whole, a whole possibility of dialogue. The Pope talks a lot about dialogue, no, uh, because he's talking about the he talks about the encounter, he talks about the dialogue, but basically listens to the other person before. And I think I think I think we have to in this country in some way, and this may be an example of it. I mean, uh, it, we have to hear each other. I don't. It doesn't threaten me, right? This is what we have to say. It doesn't threaten me that you believe differently. It doesn't. God is much bigger than both of us. I know why I believe what I believe. I can learn from listening to you, though. And I think that has to be, and I would say one word about the, the, the conservative liberal divide in the, in the Catholic Church. I, I think that that's largely a phenomenon of how it is the Catholic Church, in most churches, we tend to mimic the, the political dynamics of our native country. We tend to do that. Um, in Europe and in Latin America, it's more the progressive versus the the, the traditionalist. I mean, it's a different set of vocabularies that set that up. I, I think, and, and you find this, and people try to put Pope Francis in a box. He's either this or he's either that. But I tell people, you know, you can't. Yeah, he's going to surprise you because as soon as you think, ah, yes, that's the, he's going to say something else. Why? Because, the, the, well, because in some humble way, that's what we try to do. We try to reflect the fact that you couldn't put Jesus in a box either. In a certain way, the church transcends that, at least it should in its better moments. It's not conservative, it's not liberal, it's just the gospel. And it's going to cut different ways. And the world's going to like some of it and not like part of it, the other part of it. And, and, and that's, 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 but we have to always, you know, reconciliation and forgiveness is a big part of the gospel. And I think, I think that we have to be respectful of the dignity of the people with whom we speak. Otherwise, it's just we're just arguing across purposes. It becomes the political the politicization of the church. Um, back to that Bar Giamatti book, which was a great book. He, he regretted this was probably he wrote this in the seventies. He regretted the footballization of baseball, right? Because because now it's all the, the screens and the noise. I, and I think you could by analogy we we don't the politicization politic, I can't even say the word politizando no making more political the the. The gospel is the gospel and it has political implications. And it's up to an informed conscience to inform itself and to figure out what those implications are. It has implications with how I treat my neighbor and that ought to be expressed somehow in the good of society. I'll be very blunt when I tell my people back home, you know, it's fine if you want to be a Republican, it's fine if you want to be a Democrat, but I need you to be a Catholic first. Well, I'm not going to tell you how to vote because you wouldn't listen to me anyway and probably make you vote the other way just because. No, but that's the way it is, but that's okay. But just have a good conscience and recognize that your first loyalty is to the gospel. And I think we have to get past them because it is cacophonous, the noise. I think, I think the church has to, so I mean, not just the Pope, but I mean everybody. I, mean, I mentioned those having lunch, but I mentioned the fact that the papacy has become sort of like super mega, more powerful than it ever was in the Middle Ages, more than innocent than Why? Because the media has made him into the, into the, like, the image that, like, that like, defines all things Catholic. It was never that way. It never really was. He, he, was, always had, he was always like the, the big gorilla on the block. You couldn't ignore him in Catholic life. But, but the, fact is, the fact is the churches have always kind of like you know, had a give and take, and you know, bishops, bishops could disagree with him, though not publicly, I and mean, that's just the thing. Why not publicly? Because, because it's the same reason I would never contradict my father in public. He's my father. I could tell him, Dad, I don't think that's a good idea, but never in front of, never in front of like the sister-in-laws. Oh, would I get a talk? <laughs> But it's the same dynamic. I mean, but, but the papacy always had that, the give and take between the bishops. I mean, when we get behind doors, you know, 
But charity requires that you treat you. It's a family thing. At least you could. No comment, you know. So, anyway. Anyway, okay. One more. One more. Otra pregunta. Sí. Ah. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things that, that is not being, uh, you should know that when it comes to the Anglican Company Miners, my diocese runs from the tip of South Texas, you know, Brownsville, which is right on the border with Mexico, and it runs all the way up the Rio Grande River, almost to Laredo. So basically, I'm a border bishop. Right? McAllen is, 80% of the unaccompanied Miners in Central America pass through my diocese. I talked to those kids. I went to Honduras to figure out what was going on there, because I was hearing from people. Uh, first of all, they don't have diseases. You hear this, they have diseases. Uh, did immigration, they check all that. They're, they're, they're healthy kids. They're smart. And you say, well, why are you here? We only have so much resources. Go home, go home. But you hear that from the media. Because if I go home, they kill me. I say, how? If you don't join the gang and, and become part of the cartel, they kill you. There's nothing. Now, for us, I mean, you don't hear that in the media because it becomes, well, you know, that. And a lot of them, I think what we don't hear is that a lot of times we think, well, everybody wants to come to the United States, and, and which, let me tell you something that the media doesn't tell us. The media, most people, we're all patriotic. Patriotism is a virtue, you know, it's tied to the virtue of piety and so forth. But, but, but most people love the country they're from and would prefer to stay there. And only an extreme thing would cause them to move. Uh, like a life and death issue. Uh, a lot of times, they, a lot of these young people come here not because they want to live the American dream, but because they want to be able to live the Central American dream. And by that I mean they want to come, they want to work for a couple, of, they can work for six months and make enough money to live for years in Honduras and go home. Why? Because their families are there. Anyway, that doesn't get talked about a lot. But what you don't hear about how, how heavily, in, these people are made pawns especially children, are made pawns in the, in the hands of very powerful forces that operate in our world. I call it, when I'm preaching back home, el juego del mundo, no, the game of the world. The game of the world is control and money. And what it does is the cartels and the subsidiary industries that traffic in people, it's a hemispheric phenomenon. These kids may leave Central America to get in, and cross Mexico, which is a very dangerous thing to do, to try to get to the United States. A lot of them never make it here. They make it to maybe Mexico, but Mexico is better than Central America as far as most of them are concerned in terms of economics. But a lot of times they come, but they never make it. Why? Because they're kidnapped. Why? Because they are sold into prostitution rings. They are sold into, into uh, human slavery. And sometimes they are harvested for their organs. Now we're talking about the most calamitous, heinous of evils that is you being used to make some very powerful forces very wealthy. And that doesn't get talked about. And what, but it's not the kid's fault. The kid is trying to find a way to have a better life so he can raise a family and, and yet they're Pawns. I think this, if one, wants to understand, if one wants to get what Pope Francis is about, it's about the world cannot be indifferent to how it is that some people matter and some people don't. And the society, especially the economically affluent society, has decided some people are important and some people are expendable. That is contrary to the gospel. That is what Pope Francis is about. And that, I think, is exemplified in this whole phenomenon of immigration from Central America, but other parts of the world as well. There's a tremendous, there's a whole market in people, and it's diabolical. The devil's end game is always despair. The devil is only slightly amused by our sins. What he really wants is despair. That is, give up. Goodness will not triumph. God does not hear you. 
That's the end game. It's always been the end game. And the response of the Christian believer is, no, we don't give up. Grace triumphs. The truth can be crucified, but it rises. And the way that has to be implemented in the life of the church is to make a public witness about that in this country and all over the world, about the dignity of human life and that according to the way the Lord Jesus treated people, there's no such thing as some people are more important than others. People, as I said in the talk, by virtue of human dignity, deserve to be treated with respect. Punto y acabo. I think that doesn't get talked about in the media. I, I'm very proud of the Bryson Tassies of Brownsville because you know what? We, we set up some centers to take care of, of, of unaccompanied children and their mothers. Why? Because after immigration detains them, because they would turn themselves in, the mother, the, if they were unaccompanied minors, they're whisked off into HHS. That's the way the government, because there's certain laws, which are good laws in many respects, because they, 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 they have certain protections. But if, they have, if their mothers are with the children, then, 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 then by law, the immigration would then process them, make sure they had a relative to whom they would be able to go contact, and waiting their court hearing, which is part of the way the law, and, and then they would leave them at the bus station, the mother with the children. I'm talking about children that are six, seven, eight, nine years old, sometimes babies. They hadn't changed clothes since they left Central America a month before. Most of them were dehydrated. Most of them had not had a decent meal, maybe an apple here or a fruit there, because they depend on the charity of people along the way. And what happened is that the people of the Rio Grande Valley, which you should know is one of the poorest areas in the United States, but the people of the valley saw, they had their eyes open, they saw people in need at the bus station, and they started dropping off food and water and clothes and backpacks for the kids and stuff like that. That's how it all started. That's the Christian response. I'm convinced, even though I just spent a whole hour talking about the law and all sorts of stuff, but the, fit, the first Christian response is not to change the law. The first Christian response is to deal with the person in front of you. And the church has to have the freedom to do that. That's why the law thing is important. But it's not get the cart before the horse. The importance is the church has to have the freedom to go and say, can I help you? And so after that, we realized, because the bus station didn't want so many people dropping off casseroles and, and carne guisada at the places, so we opened up a center, and, that's, and it's still going, and it still does. We were getting hundreds a day of mothers and children, and now it's, you know, they're still, they're still moving. Um, it, has come, it has slowed down, but we're still getting 60 to 80 mothers and children a day, and we don't, that's not even talking about the unaccompanied minors. And people ask me, why has the number gone down? Hmm. Because there are forces who control the movement of peoples. It's heinous. But you've got to look at the person. The church needs the freedom to address the need of the person. And that's why this legal stuff is all important. I think those sorts of things don't get talked about a lot. Um, the people of the Rio Grande Valley are very generous. I have little old ladies living in, you know, I have third world conditions in my diocese, but most of the country does if you look in the right places, if you know where. Little old ladies give me a dollar fifty here. This is for the mothers and the babies. Porque los pobres son los más generosos. The poor are often the most generous. And that's a fact. And it's nothing Jesus didn't already tell us. Anyway. Time passes quickly. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you for one of the most important lectures we've sponsored here, and we definitely want you to come back and visit our campus again. Thank you. Thank you again for coming. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.